Our lesson today is from the 26th chapter of Acts, and it is uh, Paul's defense before Agrippa. And instead of reading the entire passage, I'm going to take the heart of it where Paul talks uh, about his experience along the Damascus Road. And he speaks to Agrippa and says, Indeed, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things against the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is what I did in Jerusalem with authority received from the chief priests. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison, but I also cast my vote against them when they were being condemned to death. By punishing them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And since I was so furiously enraged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. With this in mind, I was traveling to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. When at midday along the road, Your Excellency, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and my companions. When we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It hurts you to kick against the goads. I asked, Who are you, Lord? The Lord answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you to serve and testify to the things to which you have seen and to those in which I will appear to you. I will rescue, rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. This is the word of the Lord. As I was reading this brief summary of Paul's experience on the road to Damascus, I wonder if you noticed how it doesn't, as they say, it doesn't sink with some of the language that we use today in churches that will talk about having your own Damascus Road experience. I mean the kinds of churches, uh, and there, many of them are non-denominational and very large, some are denominational, uh, but uh, they have very wide programs, but at the heart of their existence there's a bottom line. The bottom line is you must accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior or you will spend eternity in hell rather than in heaven. Uh, it's such a simple agenda that people outside of the church even know it. If you ask some people walking by a large church on a Sunday morning if they intend to go there or if they have any interest in becoming a Christian, they probably will say to you, I'm not interested in it. They have a simple agenda, believe or else, and they call that the good news. How can such a threatening message be called the good news? At any rate, uh, the language that we're hearing today in these churches is not the language that we read in our scripture lesson. If you ask this Paul in our lesson, uh, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? He doesn't know what we're talking about. If you ask him, uh, are you glad that you're not going to hell and going to heaven instead, he doesn't talk this way. Indeed, if, if you took the Saul in this lesson and took him to one of our churches and they began questioning him, they probably would come to the conclusion that he has not been saved and that they need to work on making a convert out of him. What you can't see in this very brief statement of Paul is that it's really a condensation of much longer uh, narratives about 
the Damascus Road. The author of the Book of Acts loved this story, he tells it three times with different variations. And if you go back to the beginning, you find it's not a very brief thing that happens. Uh, it happens over long periods of time. There are many different events and characters. Starting with the, the moment when he is overcome by this bright light and he's lying there blind by the road, God says to one of the members of the church uh, up there in, in Damascus, uh, his name is Ananias, he said, now, uh, go uh, to this Saul who's lying blind by the road and welcome him into the family. And Ananias understandably says, uh, Lord, this is a guy who was coming up here to kill me. You want me to go and welcome him into the family? Is this some kind of a trap? Well, anyway, he goes. It says, Brother Saul, he welcomes him into the family of faith, and he is baptized. And Saul is, uh, as they call him before he becomes Paul, is so taken by this experience, immediately, instead of persecuting the churches in Damascus, he goes to the synagogues and says to them in so many words, I was all wrong, I had it all backwards. Jesus is the Messiah. And they're so shocked by his change of heart that they decide they to put this guy out of commission and they seek to kill him. Uh, and so the believers in Damascus to protect Paul uh, by night let him down over the walls in a basket. And what he does, he escapes and goes, it says, to Arabia. Now, it's not talking about Arabia as we know it, but probably what is happening is that he is replicating the experience of uh, the prophet uh, uh, Elijah when he was being pursued by Jezebel. And he's told to go to Sinai. Now, we're not sure of all of this. If it sounds confusing, not even biblical scholars agree to it. But he's replicating uh, the previous experience of the prophet Elijah. And what happens, we don't know. Is he thinking things through or what? But it takes three years. This is not an overnight experience. After three years, that friendly uh, disciple named uh, Barnabas takes him to Jerusalem, introduces him uh, to Peter and to James, the Lord's brother, and uh, assures them that his faith is genuine, this is the real thing that he's experienced. And uh, so he then goes off to Syria and Cilicia, and he is gone for 14 years. What he's doing there, we're not told. In fact, you have to weave into his story his missionary journeys, and to put together a complete chronology is, well, for most of us it's impossible, and I don't know if the biblical scholars even have it correctly. But he keeps on preaching, starting churches, and writing letters to those churches until he is martyred and dies in the year 64. And here's the interesting thing. By the time his life comes to an end in 64, Paul has written most of the New Testament. In fact, he has written all of the New Testament that exists at that point. If you want to know what early Christianity is like, the only thing you can read are the letters of Paul. The Gospels have not yet been written. Uh, if we were to arrange our New Testament in the order in which it was written, it would all be by Paul, first of all. He is early Christianity. And when he finally is martyred in 64, the first gospel, the Gospel of Mark, hasn't even been written. That's how so much had to happen along what you would call uh, Paul's experience on the road to Damascus. 
It's one that takes a long time before he becomes in our mind uh, the character we call Saint Paul. But you know, isn't it, isn't this all, the way it always is? I mean, if, if you had to sit down this afternoon and tell the whole story of how you became the Christian that you are, it would go over years. There are different characters, there are different events, there are different experiences, but they're all part of your Damascus Road. Uh, that's just the way it works. The Damascus Road is different for each of us and we have these different experiences by which we come to where we are in faith today. I can hear someone saying, oh, okay, Morgan, tell us your story. Well, what I'm going to say is going to be a shocker, so I'm going to say it twice, especially for those listening far away in Texas and California. I never accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I'll say that again. I have never accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. It was the other way around. He accepted me. You need to know something about my, my personal background uh, as I say that. I was not brought up in the church. My parents belonged to a church, but like many blue-collar families, in the 1930s, during the Great Depression, there was not enough money to go to church. They'd go on Easter, but you know, when you're living on less than uh, $100 a month, uh, you're embarrassed to go to church. You, you don't have money to put in the plate. However, for a short time, they sent me to Sunday school. I remember the room in which it happened, but it didn't last very long. Somehow or other, it didn't work. But then when I was in junior high school, one of my classmates was the son of the past, pastor of this church, the Bellevue Reformed Church. His name was Calvin. And he said to me, you know, we've got quite a deal going, and you might be interested in it. He said, if you come to the junior high Sunday school class, if you attend regularly, you can come to the church gymnasium and shoot baskets on Thursday night. Well, it seemed like a pretty good trade-off, so I started going to that junior high Sunday school class, and the teacher was a very interesting, pleasant person. However, after a while, here I am, uh, five feet six inches, uh, pushing toward five seven, I suddenly realized that I didn't have much of a future in basketball, and so that all ended. So here I am, at the end of junior high school, heading into high school, and I'm churchless. Now here comes an event which is totally unplanned. At this point, up in the attic where I had my bedroom, I found a New Testament. The date was 1900 in it, in my uh, aunt's name, Susan Morgan. And it was pretty well worn and dried out. It was a red letter version of the King James Version of the New Testament. And I started reading it. I wanted in particular to find the story about the prodigal son. The reason I wanted to find it is that as I'd listened to the original Grand Ole Opry back in the old days, uh, Roy, Roy Acuff had a song, A Prodigal Son Once Strayed from His Father to Travel the Road with Hunger and Pain. I wanted to find that, and I don't know how I did. There was no index, no concordance, but I found it. And I memorized it word for word in the King James Version. And then I started memorizing other passages. Why I'm doing this, I don't know. I'm not afraid that I'm going to hell or anything like that. Uh, it just interested me, and I kept memorizing them, and I didn't tell anyone. Finally, I had to tell someone because I had a, a slight problem with one verse. Behind me in a science seating in high school biology, there's a girl named Doris. Uh, it's a science seating. She wants to be a missionary, but she's not after me to try to save me or anything. And I asked her a question about this verse, and she said, you're reading, you're reading the New Testament. I said, I'm reading it and memorizing it. 
She said, you, you belong in our church. So I went to her church, which was the first Presbyterian church. And they did everything possible to save me, uh, to show me how to get Jesus into my heart. There'd be some traveling evangelist that would come uh, at the end of the meeting. He'd ask you to raise your hand that you want to accept Jesus and let him into your heart. And I'd do that, and I'd go to the room where they would say a certain prayer for you. But it wasn't happening. Jesus wasn't getting into my heart. There'd be prayer groups and meetings with other young people. There'd be Bible study groups. And the other young people would say how different life was since Jesus had come into their heart. But to be honest, it wasn't working for me. I was saying all the prayers, doing all the stuff they said would make it worse, but Jesus wasn't coming into my heart. The um, next thing that happens uh, is very interesting. And it happens on April 1st. 1945. It's Easter Sunday, uh, and it's the day after my 17th birthday. And I have listened to uh, a terrible uh, go-to-hell sermon in church. They were all that way in this church. Uh, and uh, I can't find any reason uh, to explain this experience. I'm getting along wonderfully with my parents. My parents were much older. By the time I was 17, my father was 62. I had a great deal of liberty. I got along well with them. Uh, I'm getting better than average grades in school. I have lettered every year in track and cross country, so I have athletic uh, popularity. But on that Sunday afternoon, on Knott Terrace near my high school, I'm walking alone and it is as though an iron gate has opened and someone is beckoning and saying, come on in. Now, I didn't hear any voices. I want to make that clear. I'm trying to tell you how I figured this out over time. But I went in. And uh, as I went deeper in, uh, it's appears that this is, in my mind, Jesus. And he says, where have you been all these years? And I said, what do you mean, where have you been? I've been trying to get, uh, get, you, uh, get uh, you in my heart. That's what they told me to do at church. And he says, you don't have to do that. I've always been in your heart. They've got it all backwards. They're telling you you have to take Jesus and let him into your heart. And what I'm telling you is I've always been in your heart. And I say, since when? He said, since before the planet Earth was even created. He said, go look at your memory verses that you have. Read Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. Before th there was even a world, God had predestined you to be adopted as one of his children. I live in every heart. Evangelism isn't what they call it trying to get Jesus into your heart. I am in every heart. I live in every heart. And if evangelism is anything, it's the business of really, really realizing that Jesus lives in every heart. We are all the children of God. We've had different experiences, but we're traveling together. We're all headed home to be in the Father's house. Well. You've heard me say that time and time again. But that's how I got to this conclusion that we're all the children of God. We're all traveling on different roads to Damascus. And we're going to keep traveling. We're not there yet. But this is my story. This is what happened on my road. I wonder what happened on your road. But God bless you. Stay on the road because... We're all the children of God in Jesus Christ. Amen.